good day. It's Star 80, 80 Downs, 80 Dolls, in 80 Years. And we have Mark with a C from Germany. We're having some transatlantic issues with technology, but I thought it would be really important to incorporate this Diana Ross fan from Germany. Tell us about yourself, Mark. How long have you known and liked Diana Ross, the singer, the actress, the savior? Well, I'm, I'm 29 and from Germany. Um, if something is uh, hanging up, something it's the connection, the internet, the ocean, whatever. Um, Diana Ross, um, it, I, it feels like I've known her forever, but um, basically, it must have stopped somewhere in the 90s when I heard Upside Down or Chain Reaction for the first time on the radio without knowing who it was. Um, then there came the association with um, You Keep Me Hanging On, but I knew the wild version before. Um, but yeah, somehow later in the 2000s when internet access was more readily available, um, I found out of it, I, you know, and um, yeah. Now I'm here. So the first Star 80 question we're going to go into, Mark, is of all the Diana Ross songs, excluding the Supremes, what Diana Ross Star 80 song really resonates with you? And tell us why. Like, what song really, like, it just got you through something or you just kind of exercise to it or you walk to it? Or what song means the most to you? But it's just one song. And then maybe tell us why. Well, if you would say exercise, I would have to say rock that body, but I don't like that song, so that's not it. Um, it, it must be chain reaction. Um, it's just an infectious feeling. I love it. It's happy. It's joyful. Um, it has a great melody. It builds up constantly uh, until the last chorus is where she really explodes with, with her vocals, and um, I think it can't get better than this except for the um 12 inch remix which goes on even longer so yeah it's chain reaction it's one of the earliest songs of her i knew it must be because it was a big hit in the 80s and in germany um me being from the former gdr um we really didn't know much pop music until the 1990s so this is one of the songs of her that got played on the radio along with Upside Down and um, yeah it really struck a chord with me since I was a small boy Inter so, interesting it, interesting and that song did go number one on um, you know around the world it was a really big smash and of course has that amazing music video and it's an iconic song iconic song by Diana Ross and it's interesting because in the United States it was received like it went to 25 on the adult contemporary. It, it kind of bottomed out at 66 with the remix that you mentioned in 1986. Yeah, so. And the, the remix went to 67 or something like that. Correct, correct. The remix went to 66 on the Billboard charts in America, but overseas and in Israel and in um, all parts of the world, Australia, UK, particularly in the in Ireland, it went number one and it, like has many silver and gold discs across wherever it topped the charts. In America, it wasn't as received as well. And um, I do agree with you. The special dance mix is really special. And it went to the top 10, 20 again in 1993 because Diana released it overseas as for her four, 30th anniversary, the Forever Diana thing so uh the forever diana box set which is probably when you were coming of age and it was she was kind of appreciated all over again it's interesting that you bring up that you're from overseas oh don't date me all right in terms of i did uh, yeah i was i was more than 10 uh, a lot more than 10 the uh but that seriously it's amazing to me how um someone like diana ross has has you know, like a ripple effect, she still, you know, can attract people from all over the planet. And then years and years after, you know, when she made her first impression with the Supremes and her impression, that was a deep impression as a solo artist with an Oscar nomination and so forth. So the Star 80 question number two, what, Star 80 question number two, 
what particular era of Diana Ross's very storied career means something to you? I mean, it could be like a YouTube video you saw from the past or something currently. Maybe it was when you were at the uh, city center in 2017 where I met you uh, after the after party with Andy and everybody. Now, what what moment in Diana's career means the most to you? What, what moment, what era? Um, I would say the 70s are particularly fun for me. Um, mostly the um, 1976 era with the Diana Ross album, with the iconic photographs, um, the black and white thing, with, with the succession of singles that she had with uh, Jim from Margoni, um, I, I thought uh, it took a little time, but today I fell in love. Yes, yeah. it's such a clumsy title, and um, when you try, it is long. It, it's like a breathtaking, yeah. soul-taking, first sight, love-making, heartbreaking guy. It's really long, but at least as a parenthesis. Yeah. It's better than laughing over and um, one love in a lifetime. Great succession of singles. Um, great um image with this album. Um, I really like this era. And um, the same, the mid to late 70s is the time where he really got to be herself when he got away from Barry Gordy's pump, where Motown created her image, and she got to be more herself, culminating in um, The Boss and uh, the 1980 Diana album. So this particular time was an exciting time for Diana, Image-wise, music-wise, Motown gave her more freedom. It that for some things. So, um, yeah, it was an exciting time to be... Um, Diana Ross and a Diana yeah. Ross fan, right? It was an exciting time. And of course, that excitement still lingers and lingers and lingers. That album is close to being 50 years old. And um, it still matters. And people still listened and danced to Love Hangover. And, um, you know... People are sampling a lot of the songs from that album as well. So interesting. It was, in a, was it Will Smith in the 90s? Yeah. In 1999, he sampled it, as did Randy and Monique. I think they did a song. Oh, there's an email from work. Um, they, uh, but Brandy and uh, the, the, they had, they sampled our Monique, I think, Monica sampled Love Hangover in a song too. And it's it's a it's a it's a song that just is timeless. And that's why we're celebrating the magic as it leads to Diane Ross's 80th birthday. I failed to mention that I'm interviewing people from around the world, including yourself, because we're leading kind of the Diane Ross's 80th birthday. And yes, she's the the face of YSL uh for the 2024 season. I know. And she looks amazing. Yeah. And so this is your way to say thank you to Diane Ross in this self-proclaimed Star 80 Hellish hashtag that only I could self-produce. And we're really self-production here because our Zoom doesn't even work. All right. So, but there's nothing going to stop me, baby. So the next Star 80 question is what gown of Diana Ross really, you're like so excited that she came out with that gown or you saw her, I know you saw her at City Center on April 26, 2017. That's when I met you. It was a rainy night. And it was a great night. We were really close. I helped the grandchildren get on stage because I was that close. What song or what gown during that performance really like spoke to you and you couldn't believe? I don't know. I just just tell us this experience with a gown that you saw at a show that you were like, oh my gosh, it's like unbelievable i'm moved by this this is just so incredible well i'm i'm not too much into gowns but okay when it comes to that when it comes to that <laughs> let's say it like that okay uh, I, I like the more simple approach approach um that's why i'm, I'm totally in love with the 1980 diana look for the album cover it was so simple, so streetwise, so accessible to anyone because you look glamorous, 
but accessible. She was glamorous because she really had a loss. And there, there wasn't the weave, the extension wasn't there. The makeup was light or kiddingly made up like there's no makeup. And she had like that wet look with the jeans and the t-shirt, which was an accident. You know, those jeans were Gia, yeah. the model. She wasn't, she wasn't nice to leave. And then she came back and was it Harry Langdon? Yeah, it was Langdon. Actually, it was it wasn't Harry Langdon. It was we talked about that. No, it was actually. Uh, uh, I always say his last first name wrong, and I'll probably say his last name. School vote. School vote. He did. He did. Yeah, he did, yeah, he did swept like away too. But the inside was Douglas Kirkland, which was photographed for the boss session. But the 1980 session with the jeans and shirt t-shirt was Scuvolo. Scuvolo. All right, don't know though. Yeah. Italian. Yeah, yeah. And he also did Swept Away, which was a gateful, but black and white, but with a spiky yeah. hair. Okay. And that was on Capital RCA around the world. So interesting. Well, I didn't want to put you on the spot about the gowns, but I get I get your feeling that look is important. And she she always surprises us with looks and album yeah. covers and all that. So the next question is, you know, question number four. What of Diana Ross's career to you is like your favorite? We talked about the favorite part of her career, but what is her lasting legacy you think that Diana Ross gives us? Like, or but what do you think will be, whether it's acting or singing or dancing, what is it that, or not dancing, dancing, acting, what is it in Diana Ross's career that you think is going to be the lasting thing that she does like what is it like what's going to be the time piece of diana ross's legacy like you think that's really going to like be the forever the forever diana forever diana in the most diana um uh, when i it into a one song um for, for me at least it's um i know people all other people will say the witch out and touch thing because she goes to the audience and but yet in the most high enough in this respect, bring so much of Diana to the stage because she, when you reach it, it's, it's a song that connects her, that um, gives people power and strength. It's the song that um, she sang in a um, simple part. So that's the best thing for me. It is a song that I think most people expect to hear, and it always closes the show. Once it opened and closed the show. But it really is a great closing song because it's such a powerful song. It makes you get up and go and gamble or whatever, wherever she is, just gives you that, you know, lifting you up kind of spirit. So interesting that you bring Ain't No Mountain High Enough as that that's the that's it for her. Um, with regard to a deep cut, like what song by Diana Ross, question number five, what is the deep cut or a song that you think is like, it should have been a big hit. It just didn't quite make it. And we're talking about like that song in that movie, Saltburn. It's in, the, it's charting again called Murder on the Dance Floor. And it has a good hook. It's it's becoming relevant in many, many years after the fact. What deep cut or B-side or just album cut that you think is a missed opportunity that should have been a hit in Diana Ross's very story, vast catalog of recordings? Pointing to um, you can do whatever you want. This is your this is your opinion. Well, for the seventies, I would say you were the one. Interesting. Is, um, um, it's it's disco is an amazing um vocal performance. You really think her heart out. Um, it is uplifting and it's an intention tune. For the eighties, I would say um. Something of the 1983 was an album, I would say, up front, really had a big hit because same with you already one is an infectious melody. Um, it had great remixes. Um, there were two or even three different mixes. Yes. Yeah. So it had all the ingredients to be a hit, but well, I think RTA promotion at that time wasn't the best effort. Um, in the 90s, anything from the Take Me Higher album should have deserved to be a bigger hit. Okay. Interesting. So you gave us like a little pocket of like the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. Yeah. Is there any song since it were in the 2020s? Is there any song from the Thank You album that really resonates with you or you think 
and then potentially it could be a hit because if murder on the dance floor could be a charting hit in you know many many like 20 something years after the fact maybe a song from thank you with ysl's you know cross promotion hopefully that it could be a, a chart hit around the world what what cut from thank you you know speaks to you the most the new the new cd the new album new ish the title song is uh, really uplifting i really love that and it could have been a bigger hit with better promotion um also turn up the sunshine the the, the thing that you did after um with Tame and Pela. It does have a nice punch to it. It really does. Yeah. I, it's, it's, um, it's, I love Diana Bellas, but um, I don't like her to be only associated with the ballads. Um, I think um, the nine ships were kind of a bit gone. Was it Peter Asher who produced much of the ballads? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Peter Asher did the ones in the the Force Behind the Power album. He also did yes. a few on the most of the album of I Love You, which were ballads. Um, um, yeah. I mean, I love a good ballad, but if it's only ballad, um, you limit yourself to be just like a chord singer. So when you have this deep bobby tune that are making you dance um, and making you get up and shake your ass or whatever, it is so great and um it shows that he when was thank you released was it like 2021 it was november 5th 2021 i think it's the day after chutney's birthday yeah. um yeah so it was the great city like that um it, it did it. um i mean there's one video which was Great. Um, oh, and, and I still believe that was a video, right? Or all as yeah. well. She too. Yeah. The other, the other two. Were you in the video where it was like a crowd funded or crowd pleasing, fan pleasing video where the different people were on it? Were you in the video? No. Oh, okay. I'm I wasn't sure. either. I, I don't do these things. Oh, I'm, you. I'm, yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a big other fan, and these things always make me personally cringe I, I don't I, I like it when people pour their heart and soul into stuff like that but it's not for me i'm not judging but uh um for abba they um Agneta, you know um one of the singers she did one thing like that or something like that for a single like um, 10 years ago it was total cringe uh, i'm not for that but um to all the people who are brave enough to do it, it's yeah. always great. Well, for the record, I was brave enough, but I was kind of passed. I was passed on. I shouldn't mention that, but I have to. I I, I thought maybe, but I didn't, didn't tell anyone, and now I'm telling the world. I My clip wasn't acceptable. So moving, moving, moving on. I, I, I'm worth, I, 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 I'm all about, I would, that would have been a fun thing, but you know what? Everyone, you know, every everything comes in its own time. So that being yeah. said, um, moving to the sixth question, um, uh, I think I'm kind of doing the questions out of order because my hand is tired and I don't have my notes in front of me because we weren't able to do the Zoom. So I'm going to be pushing the questions a little out of order. But number six is the question. Um, well, we're going to pretend this is number six. It's if you were to pick a, du a duet partner for Diana Ross, it could be someone from the past, someone that's of the present, or even someone that's like deceased, even before Diana was performing at like 14 uh, with Lupin Records and Lupine Records or Motown Tamla and our Deca, whatever. What Motown, what would be uh, what would be the duet partner for you? Oh, um, I, I, I saw, uh, saw some of the other videos, so I oh. was coming, and I gave it some thought, because do it, yeah, do it. Mm. Do it have to be well, carefully planned, and um, I would love uh, Diana do it. So that's possible because Donna Summer and Diane Ross did a lot of songs together, particularly there was a song called There Goes My Baby that Donna Summer did first. And then Diane did like the traditional version of it. Yeah. That could be kind of 
mashed up together or some of the, the ballads, the sort songs that they did. And with artificial intelligence, we don't, we don't like to talk about it in academia or in life, but there's all things are possible, you know, with AI and we, you and I could tinker over the overseas and, and create a duet with Donna Summer and Diana Ross, possibly. Uh, even with I Feel Love sampled, uh, I live in Love and Living and Given has a sample of the, the I Feel Love by Donna Summer sampled in the remix of Love and Living and Given, which of course is the album with a cigarette with Ross that, that you mentioned, yeah. you're, you were the one. So since you went through all those questions and my hand is about to fall down, uh, do you remember this one of the questions that I didn't ask? In this, we talked about the gowns, we talked about the deep cut, we talked about the duet, the favorite song and how it resonates with you. The duet, um, help. Movie. Movie. Okay. With her, with her, do you have a favorite Diana Ross performance in a film that, that or just performance in general that you saw on YouTube that you think is, oh, that's it. Well, as a very well performance, I think it's so amazing when she's on the stage. But um, oh, I did. I know the. I know the question was live or Memorex. Do you like her live, or do you like her in the recording, listening to her? That was the question. So we got them all. That's, that's hard to choose. All right. In the studio, you have a controlled environment and. In the studio, as we know with Motimes, they used all the best bits and pieces and often compiled the stuff. And also with the other productions, uh, you get the best pieces of Diana and all the ad libs and whatever. So that's hard to choose sometimes because a recording is amazing. But when you see her live, you get this love and um, you get this energy. So it is hard to choose. If I would say um, on record, I prefer the studio work. If I see her, I prefer her life. Okay. Because live albums, which are also a possibility, they never translate that well. Yeah. So it is depending on the circumstances, I would say. Right. So it's all circumstantial. So interesting enough, as we close this conversation on Zoom meets Facebook, this is a real hybrid affair. There's a Netflix yeah. special that I don't know if you have access to. If you have Netflix where you are, it's it's based on the greatest night of pop and it's We Are the World recording. It's interesting mm -hmm. that we are the world right now and that we're, you know, I'm in New York, Manhattan, and you're in what part of the world are you at? in Germany. Wow. So cool. We are the world. We are the children. Um, I don't know if we're, we're the ones to make a better day, so let's start giving, but we are the world we right are. now, representing... I saw, it. I saw it yesterday, and it was... In, in, um, because with Diana, so many things have been said and written, and um, not always in the most favorable way, but in this documentary, and that's what I always get from when I see Diana in any situation, that she's a dedicated artist and so much, so full of love. And um, one of the engineers said it at the end, really what Diana is about for me, he was the last one to be there. And she sat there and cried. And she was sad that it was all over. Yeah. So this is really magical about this woman. She is a full professional and dedicates herself to whatever she does. Yeah. And so it's all the love and passion she has. Yeah. And that's why she's a I so as we leave this call, I want to thank you so much for taking the time. We've been having a little start, you know, stops and starts with this. And of course, nothing's going to stop us now. Uh, that's um, a Samantha Fox song. Uh, that also is. How can you bring up Samantha Fox and Diana? I know I'm. It's a sacrilege, but on the fall. So I'm gonna I'm gonna like thank you so much for allowing me to say Samantha Fox. Um, and I um. I'm going to stop the recording and thank you so much. And no, seriously, thank you. I just got because my hands are about to fall off. That was great.
great. No, you you were great. And, th and when I got all the seven questions in, so wonderful. And um, I will, um, I'm going to take an image of you and superimpose it with the star 80 thing. And you are the perfect 10. You're number 10 in the interviews. <laughs> did you watch? Uh, which ones did you watch? Because Dina was on my case about like uh, talking over people or getting too excited and not letting Nick Ted. I didn't let him talk as much. So I'm, I'm not a journalist, but I really, you know, wanted to say. I just saw Andy now, um, Andy's career. Yeah. Okay. His, his was really good. I thought that was an improvement. Yeah. Uh, and then I did Michael Musto, who was a uh, gossip columnist. Uh, and I po posted his, and then you're number 10. So I will have this up um, probably in a few minutes when the, when the recording is done. And I think it'll be on YouTube.